Good morning and welcome to our service on this Sunday the 11th of April 2021, the week after Easter Sunday. And you're most welcome to join us here and you'll find on our webpage and on our Facebook page there's um, a link to a YouTube playlist with some music that should go with this morning's service and also details of the reading if you want to read it for yourself um, or read it in a different translation. And so let's begin our worship and let's begin in prayer. Lord, we come from a world confused about truth. We come with our own uncertainties. Let us bring the darkness of human understanding into the presence of God, who is light. Let us bring the story of our search for truth and share in fellowship the things that we have heard and seen and touched. Lord, you accept our doubts and embrace our questions like a wise parent, encouraging your children to express themselves, hiding your hurt at our scepticism, always hoping for the best and seeing our potential. We worship and adore you for believing in us. We confess that we're so often judgmental of others. In particular, we berate those who don't share our beliefs. What need have they of proof? Why can't they just believe? And yet we live in a world where little is taken at face value. Fake news surrounds us and the camera definitely does lie. Therefore, Lord, forgive us when we look down upon the unbelievers, the doubters, the ones who demand proof. For this is the world in which we live and the world to which we must proclaim your truth. There is no proof we can offer in these times except to show our belief in the ways in which we reach out by accepting and loving unconditionally, by showing patience and forbearance to those who differ from us, or is it we who differ from them? Therefore forgive us when we fail to reflect your truths in our daily lives. And let us become testaments to your risen power. May Christ be evident in us and in all that we do. Hear Jesus as he says to you, you are forgiven. Amen. Let's join together and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, today we take our reading from John's Gospel and carries on where we left off last week after Mary had gone to the tomb and found the stone rolled away and who she thought was the gardener was actually Jesus. So John chapter 20, beginning to read at verse 19. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together but fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered and stood among them and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples, seeing the master with their very own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, 
unless I see the nail holes in his hands and put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. And so may God add his understanding to the reading of his word. Today is the second Sunday of the Easter season. And maybe we should call it Thomas Sunday, because almost every year Thomas is highlighted for his doubts. Every year the Gospel tells the story of Jesus' special appearance among the disciples to greet Thomas. There's much to appreciate about Thomas, and also much we can learn from him. There are two things. First thing is to learn is about the disciples and faith. And the second is about doubt in general. So let's start with Thomas' unfortunate adjective, doubting Thomas. He's always called doubting, which to my mind makes it seem as if the other disciples had more faith than he did. And that makes Thomas a bit of a problem. But I'm not convinced it worked that way. Maybe the problem really wasn't with Thomas. Maybe it was with the others. Remember what happened. For one reason or another, Thomas was not with the others on Easter morning. The Bible doesn't say why, but I suspect it would have been for a good reason. After all, they were hiding away in this room with the doors and windows locked because of their fear of the authorities tracking them down and delivering them to a similar fate to Jesus. So Thomas didn't share their experience of the risen Lord. That meant they had something that he didn't have. And instead of their experience, what Thomas had was their word about the experience that they had seen. And in the face of all that happened over the last few days, few days the sheer fear and horror of it all, it seems that just wasn't enough. Perhaps Thomas wasn't doubting Jesus. He was doubting the other disciples. The problem was not really Thomas. The problem was the credibility of the others. They'd seen the risen Jesus. They had been given his peace and his spirit. They had seen him, had been sent by him to continue his work in the world. And it was now up to these witnesses to share the good news. That's what they were sent to do. And for whatever reason, their witness to the resurrection was not even compelling enough to convince Thomas. And Thomas wanted to believe. He was ready to believe. Maybe it's the same way now. The temptation is to say that the problem is out there, with all of those unbelievers like Thomas. If they would only shape up and believe better, then things would improve immeasurably. It's easier to do that, to complain about them, than it is to pay careful attention to the less than persuasive words and lives of today's disciples, of those who were called to be witnesses to Jesus. And perhaps it feels better to call Thomas Doubting Thomas than to call the disciples, or ourselves, unconvincing disciples. But Thomas is here to make us uncomfortable, not smug. 
Remember, faith often comes to people through the faith of others, through the life and ministry of the church. Virtually everyone out there is like Thomas. Virtually everyone out there, and maybe that includes our children and grandchildren, depends on people who already believe to point them towards faith. The other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And even though they'd seen him, they were still scared. They were still hiding behind locked doors. They were only talking to each other. Just a week earlier, Jesus had stood among them, but you wouldn't have guessed it from the way they were behaving. They didn't act like something wonderful had happened at Easter. So maybe Thomas couldn't believe them, even though he wanted to. Maybe their behaviour was conflicting with the words they were saying. Thomas was not the problem. Today's doubting Thomases are not the problem. The problem is the authenticity, the power and the persuasiveness of the church. That's the bad news. But there is good news here for us as well. Good news for Thomas, for the disciples and so for us, the church. For Christ is risen and he comes to us. Risen, he comes to the church, even when the church continues to huddle in fear behind closed doors. And maybe this is specifically relevant at this very time, as so many folk are still in fear and trepidation of leaving the safety of their own home to venture out to meet others, even though that is their deepest desire. And maybe churches want to revert to how it was before, rather than branching out to follow God's leading. Notice too Jesus' response to Thomas. There's no, oh, come on, Thomas, get a grip. Everyone else believes it. Why can't you? He gently offers to show the scars of his brutal treatment. And Thomas responds even without the offered signs, or at least we might assume that, as the gospel writer doesn't indicate that he did take up the offer. (coughs) He declares Jesus as his Lord and his God. (coughs) Excuse me. Well, this doesn't mean we're off the hook. It doesn't mean we have no responsibilities and no vocation to serve. It doesn't mean that Jesus will do it all for us and we can take it easy. But it does mean that we are able to continue, warts and all, in hope and in confidence. It does mean both that we're not alone and that we do not need to be afraid. Sometimes we fail, as the disciples failed with Thomas. But we don't stop and we don't give up. And we are free to do our best, even if it's risky. While there's always room for improvement, there is never cause for despair. We continue to struggle forward together. And Jesus continues to be found among us. The heart of the story about doubting Thomas is not about doubt, Thomas's or anyone else's. It's about the call of the church to witness to the resurrection. And the biggest piece of good news is not that Thomas comes to faith. But the biggest bit of good news is that the risen Lord still comes to his church. And that's good news for us. We are called to be witnesses to the resurrection. And our Lord is with us. But at the same time, we can't let Thomas slip by us without saying something about doubt, real, personal, bone deep doubt as to the truth or value of parts or all of this whole religious enterprise. First of all, doubt is always part of the life of faith. There is never authentic faith without doubt. That's something we all know about. And doubt is not at all a bad thing. It's a necessary thing. Doubt happens, often in times of crisis and tragedy, when life becomes too hard, too complex, too painful, sometimes just all by its own self. Faith matures with ups and downs, not in a straight line. 
So let's consider one tiny thing about doubt, ours and Thomas's, that we can learn from that story. Did you notice that Jesus didn't come to Thomas while Thomas was on his way to work, or walking the dog, or playing a round of golf, or just thinking things over? Jesus came to Thomas when Thomas was with the disciples, when he was within the fellowship of believers. Thomas didn't believe the disciples, but he did stay with them. He knew that if his doubt were ever to be met, it would be met there, not somewhere else. That's usually the way it is with us. Our doubts are usually met as we stay within the community of faith, as we hang in there, doing the sorts of things we would be doing if we weren't bothered or overwhelmed by doubt. It was a good thing, not a hypocritical thing, for Thomas to stay with the others, even when he didn't believe what they were saying. So it is for us. There's a very real connection between hanging around this place and living this life and the gift of meeting the Lord. That connection isn't simple and it isn't exact and it isn't at all predictable, but we can depend on it. He will come to us through whatever doors we lock, through whatever barriers we build. Sometimes, as it must have been with Thomas, what turns out to be the greatest moment of faith doesn't feel like faith at all. It feels like doubt. Sometimes what turns out to be the greatest moment of faith feels like just hanging on and just showing up. It feels like waiting. It feels like going through the motions. But that's all right. That's the way it works. That was what Thomas needed to do. And that was all that Thomas needed to do. Jesus did the rest. And it still works like that. Amen. Let's come to God in prayer for the world in which we live. Let's pray. Eternal and everlasting God, you are eternally patient with us. And no matter what we do, you persevere with us. Help each of us to show patience and perseverance with others. And with this prayer in our hearts and on our lips, we pray for those we know and love and those we only hear via the media. God in whom we believe, bless them. The disciples gathered behind closed doors, not only for fear of the Jewish authorities, but they gathered to grieve the loss of their friend, their leader, their visionary, their Lord. We pray for those who mourn the loss of family or friends, and especially those who've had to grieve alone in these Covid times, without the support of those who love them. <coughs> May the gentle easing of restrictions and the lengthening of the days bring them light and hope for the life ahead. God in whom we believe, bless them. For those struggling to accept the Easter message of resurrection, for those who long to have faith but miss the final step, who long to see Jesus but doubt what they see, seeing only as if in a mirror dimly. Those who long to hear your word, but grasp only a muffle and a murmur. Those who yearn to feel your presence, but shy away from contact. For those who need convincing of the truth in an age of fake news and skewed news. God in whom we believe, bless them. For those whose health and well-being teeter on the edge of uncertainty or insanity, pain, disfigurement, anguish. For those living with Covid in all its forms, long, immediate and long term. For those whose treatment is delayed and who are ground down by the mental and physical pain that can't yet be treated. 
for those who live with darkness and dread, which bombards their waking moments. God in whom we believe, bless them. For those without meaning and purpose in their lives, who wake to the morning light and dread the empty day that lies ahead. For those who dread the dark nights of wakefulness, tossing and turning. For those who feel there's no hope for tomorrow, no vision for the future, no plan for their lives. For those without a stable home life, without meaningful work and prospects. God, in whom we believe, bless them. <clears throat> and we take a moment at this particular point in the life of our country to pray for the royal family who have only very recently lost Prince Philip whose health has been challenging for some time and yet he still carried on doing his duty, standing by his queen and his wife, supporting his family. We pray that all the family are able to share their grief with you and receive comfort, <clears throat> that you will walk alongside them and help them to continue their God-given responsibilities. And for ourselves, we pray that we might banish shadows that hold us back and keep us fixed to what we are familiar with, even the new familiar, when we can be afraid to step out, step on, step forward, step up. We pray that we might know the wisdom of the psalmist, the grace of God, the blessing of the spirit, the love and companionship of each other and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> These are our prayers, made in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, thank you for being with us this morning. And I hope that something out of what has been said and shared has hit the mark for you. I hope you might feel inclined to come and join us again. Same time, same place. And so, Father, your son Jesus did not reject Thomas. Help us to value questions and questioners and not reject either when they are awkward. To discern what kind of evidence is appropriate and trustworthy in different situations and to have the courage ourselves to be questioners and seekers of truth. And so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So stay safe and we'll see you soon.